come to the book of Acts, if you would, please. I never got here this morning. I don't know if y'all noticed that or not. I gave you the passage, but I never got there. But um, anyway, I just never want you to feel like I'm putting pressure on you. I don't even put pressure on you to come to church. You come to church if you want to come to church. And if you don't, then, you know, stay home. Yeah. I, I'm glad those of you that are here are here, and I appreciate the fact that you come. Uh, but I've long since uh, come to the realization that if you have to force people by guilt or by scaring them to death, it won't last long. The second they believe that the threat is taken away, uh, they'll stop doing what's right to do. If you make the decision to do right, you'll do right even if the stars fall. That's what Bob Jones Sr. used to say. Do right even if the stars fall. There's always plenty of naysayers around, always plenty of people trying to discourage you and trying to upset you. And unfortunately, uh, some of you were raised in a time or a generation where you were made to feel like the have-tos are more important than the want-tos. Well, it shouldn't be that way. You should want to be in the re relationship with the Lord. You should want to have fellowship with the Lord. You should want to be around the saints, in spite of the fact that the saints oftentimes are not everything that you may think they ought to be. But then be honest, you're not everything that you ought to be all the time either. That's right. Amen. So if you learn to be that way about yourself, you quit being so hard on other people. Uh, we had a pretty unpleasant experience uh, a couple, three days ago, and somebody did something pretty, pretty uh, rough, and, and uh, I just told my wife, it has to do with where my father-in-law's at, and I just said, well, maybe she just had a really bad day today, and you just happened to be the one, and she goes, well, yeah, well, why did I have to be the one? And I said, well, I don't know, but maybe because you were the one now to prevent somebody else that couldn't take it. <laughs> You never know. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Acts chapter 11, we were talking this morning about your purpose of life. That's where we were both in Sunday school and in church. A purpose is the person that sets before himself an object or a goal to be reached or accomplished. So God puts you here for a purpose. Acts chapter number 11, and then Brother Brad's going to pray for us. In verse number 23, who, then, uh, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Now, obviously, there's some things that Barnabas doesn't know at this time. He doesn't know about salvation by grace through faith. He doesn't know the Pauline revelation. But you know what he said? He said they had a purpose in heart, and their purpose was that they would cleave to the Lord. They made a decision. They're going to hold on to what God would have them to do. Brother Brad, you pray, would you please, and ask the Lord to help us out and thank him for today, if you would. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Message we heard this morning. We thank you for Sunday school. We thank you for the Sunday morning service, Lord. We just thank you for coming by and meeting with us here yes. this morning, Lord. Amen. Lord, we just ask you might come by again tonight, Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, Amen. Lord Amen. We're needy people. And we need you. We need yes. it all the time, Lord. We yes. just thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. Thank you for a King James Bible. Thank you for Amen. a preacher that preaches the whole counsel of God. Amen. That uses the King James Bible. That stands on the King James Bible. Lord, I pray you might anoint him, uh, give him unction on high. And, uh, uh, hide from, uh, from you, Lord. I just pray you'd hide behind the cross. Yeah. Come speak your word. I pray that the word might uh, go, deep, go deep in our heart like the preacher was saying. And put some shoe leather that we hear tonight. Yeah. We just thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. Thank you for what we've heard already. Uh, thank you for the gentleman that got uh, baptized this morning. Amen. 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 Take care of him and watch over and protect Amen. the Lord. And just thank you for that. Thank you for all your many blessings. Lord, we sure do love you, Lord. Just thank yes. you for all your blessings. and pray you come back soon. We ask these things in precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. Brother Jesse, I owe you a public apology. I know you were supposed to join the church this morning, and I flat forgot all about it. I was running 900 miles an hour, and after that singing, Brother Roger and the, the girls did with the backup band there of the Honeyfield clan, the, 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 the guitars and the cello and the, the, the bass and the harmonica and the fiddle, and, and then those girls singing like a choir of angels, you know, and I just, I was, I... I, I was beside myself, and so I, uh, I did all I could do from pulling a brother Larry. But I was afraid I'd pull a hamstring, but I was, I mean, I was, that was getting good. And then Biggin gets up, you know, and stands up and waves that Bible around, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, but I was afraid if I stood up, I'd take off running. I mean, to me, that was just like uh, cold water on a hot day. It was just, it was refreshing to me. It was like I, I couldn't take enough of it in. And then a little Stacy Lou sitting down here who I've known since she is knee high to a grasshopper and she's sitting right down here on the front row and my plate was slap full. And uh, so I apologize. We'll get you hooked up next week, but it won't affect your salvation. 
you're saved, you're still there. You don't have to worry about it at all. The Lord's not going to kick you out because, you know, if you happen to kick off between now and when you get there, well, I'm not letting you in. You didn't get in on 3857. We've already accepted you in. You just got to go through the motions, okay? <laughs> all right. Now, Paul here is saying something that's strange to you that you might find strange. It's an Old Testament expression, but he's talking about cleaving unto the Lord. And you're never going to stick with the Lord unless you make a decision to stick with the Lord. If you don't make a decision right now in your mind, come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you don't make a decision right now and decide what you're going to do when things get bad, you won't do it when things get bad. The time to decide to follow the Lord is now. Uh, I look back there at Chief Man. He's sitting back there in the back, and you'd never know that. He's a 25-year Navy man sitting back there and, and got elevated to the position of chief and running the boat and doing the whole nine yards. And time after time after time after time, they're going through training exercises, and they're training and they're training and preparing for war and everybody doing everybody's job and then going out on cruises and going out on deployments and all that stuff. Do you know why they do that stuff? So when real war hits, the training kicks in. Yeah. Yep. The problem happens, ladies and gentlemen, the same thing happened with what I used to do. You go out there and you do a whole lot of training as far as unarmed stuff and you do stuff as far as being armed and you do stuff as far as learning how to use a use of force matrix and that kind of a deal. You know what happens to you is you don't wait until the moment a meltdown comes and then you have nothing to pull back up. You look at Warrant sitting here. Now, Warrant's the same as a chief, you might say, but they usually work through the Pentagon and stuff like that. I believe I have that correct. They're the ones that they go to and ask advice, and they got the, the, the connections, I guess I'll say. They got the hot spot where they can get on the horn and they can call somebody and find out things that other people can't find out because they have a different security clearance and stuff like that. And they run them through scenarios, and time and time and time and time and time again, they run them through scenarios in peacetime. You'll get my point in just a second. You say, why? You don't wait till the war breaks out and the battle begins to decide what it is you're going to do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that thing applies across the board. Most of you, if you have a house, you have fire insurance. You don't wait till the fire starts burning in the basement to go, you know what, it'd be a good time for me to get on the phone and get some fire insurance. Most of you, if you live in the state of Florida, even if it's just PIP, you have to have insurance. You don't wait till you have a wreck and then go, oops, I guess I should have had some insurance. In other words, you make preparation for when things get bad. You following me so far? In the Christian life, it's no different. If you don't make plans for what you're going to do when things get bad, when things get bad, you're not going to do what you need to do. And thus the reason why many Christians fail, they falter, they wind up making a mess of things because they didn't make any plans before the event took place. In the event of trouble, in the event of temptation, in the event of trial, in the event of tribulation, not the tribulation, I have to decide now what I'm going to do and that lessens the chance of me getting out or making a bad decision if there's training. Training is an important part of any job in any field, but especially in military and paramilitary uh, organizations. That training, that training, you say, why? Because when difficulty strikes, if you don't have training to revert to, you know what will happen? You'll be hiding under the curb or behind a, ga a propane gas tank for that matter. If you don't make preparations, you wind up getting yourself hurt or somebody else hurt. That's why they send you to driver's ed school. Or they used to. They're still doing that, right? And they raise the age of kids driving and stuff like that, which is probably a good thing to do. I, I completely understand all of you want to drive when you're 12, but it's probably better that you don't, but this according to statistics. But you know what you have to learn to do? You have to practice. You don't wait until it's pouring down rain outside, and that's when you decide you're going to practice your braking in a, an emergency situation. In the Christian life, you know what he said? He purposed in his heart to cling to the Lord. Now, that's a statement that's going to be tried a little bit later on because as Paul goes on, by the time you get to Acts 15, Paul really gets tried. He really gets tested. He really gets put to the, to the test in the jailhouse, in the prisons, and being beaten in a day and a night in the deep and in a shipwreck and, and in perils of robbers and in perils of his own countrymen and on top of all that, the care of all the churches. You still clinging to the Lord, Paul? I'm still clinging to the Lord. You say, why? Because I made a decision. I purposed. I decided this is what I was going to do. Look in your will, please, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Now, this comes to do with what I call a wishy-washy personality. You've got to make up your mind what you're going to do now. It can't be, well, I, today I feel this way and tomorrow I feel that way. That won't work for you in a marriage and that's not going to work for you at a job and it will not work for you in your Christian life. I didn't say you couldn't be saved. 
but you need to make up your mind and get off the cotton picking fence. You need to stop being a Laodicean Christian. You need to stop being lukewarm. You need to make up your mind now while things are going along all right, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to let my yay be yay and my nay be nay. I'm not going to make situational ethics. I'm going to decide, well, you know, I've said I'm not going to drink, but, you know, it is Christmas time, and it is Thanksgiving time, and it is uh, so-and-so's retirement party, and, and I really like her, and she likes me, and she wants a little wine, so I'll have a little wine for my stomach's sake and often infirmities. And, and, and you know, Jesus drank wine, and now you're headed for trouble. Yes, sir. You're headed for trouble. You say, what helps you not? Listen, you don't wait until the pressure is on you. Hey, man, get you something to drink, and everybody's popping the top. If you don't make your mind up what you're going to do, if you're hit with that situation now, when that situation comes, you know what's going to happen? Nine out of ten times. Sure, man, no problem. I don't care if you don't drink it, you're going to walk around with it. You have to make your mind up. And you know what I'm going to do? If they ask me that, I got a duck out. I got a tap out word. I got a, you know, let me out of here. I'm done. I'm through. I'm finished. But if you don't make that decision now, you won't make it under pressure. Now, I'm trying to tell you how to be a successful Christian. Apostle Paul was a successful Christian. You agree with that? Amen. You know why? One of the reasons is not just his doctrine and his manner of life. He made some promises. He had some purpose in his life. He had some people in his life that helped him. I used the illustration this morning of a boy by the name of Nehemiah. You get to reading through there in Nehemiah chapter number 1. He is so heavily burdened there. He's bawling, squalling, and crying and upset because he realizes that the, the wall hadn't been built. And then he goes and his countenance is falling in front of the king and the king provides him, listen to me, the king provides him some prosperity, I mean some provision, but also provides some people to help him get it done. You ain't going to make it without people to help you. You need each other, whether you believe you do or not. You ain't going, I don't need nobody. I don't need nothing. I'm on my own and all that kind of stuff. No, uh, Romans 14 said, no man's an island. You know what you need? You need the support of a good woman. I couldn't do it without her. Now, whether you think I could or not, well, it ain't your decision to make. I wouldn't be where I'm at doing what I'm doing if it wasn't for God giving me a good help me. She wasn't no mate. She is a meat. She helped me do what God would have me to do. Thank God I don't have to argue with her when it comes to me preaching. We've never had an argument over that stuff. Every now and then she said, you might want to fix that outline. You left a couple of things out. But, but, but at any rate, you know what happens? You have to make your decision. You have to make your mind up that i got to have people to get somewhere. We wouldn't have what we have here if it wasn't for people. You wouldn't be building what you have out there if it wasn't for people. You wouldn't be in fellowship with Jesus Christ right now if it wasn't for people. Stop being so hard on people. You say, well, people who need people people, they're luckiest people. No, but they're smart people. Yes. You didn't get anywhere without having people. You had a husband, you had a wife, you had a mama, you had a daddy. You brats in here, sometimes one of the things you forget about is, is the fact that you wouldn't even be breathing air if it wasn't for your mom and daddy. And long before you had enough sense to think about things and demand a car and demand a phone and demand a television and demand a computer and demand to go out and demand this and demand that, you were pooping in your diapers and eating baby food and stuff and they were changing your diapers and washing you and keeping you clean and taking you to the doctor and taking care of you when you couldn't take care of yourself and now all of a sudden you think you died and made yourself boss. They died and made yourself boss. You better pause a second and hit the pause button. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him and most of you, you wouldn't even be saved if it wasn't for them. You made it because people helped you make it. People help you make it in church. People help you make it when it comes to work. People help you do things. Some of you just too proud to ask. You just won't say, I need some help. I need Help me out. Could you help me out? Could you pray for me? Could you help me out? I'm not talking about always dollar bills. I'm saying you ever go to somebody and say, hey, could you help me with a little instruction? Maybe give me a little advice. Maybe you have an opinion or something like that. Am I about to mess up, about to do this? You're too proud to ask for help? You think you can do it on your own? You're a fool. You're an absolute fool. Why, even Jesus Christ comes along. If anybody could do it on his own, you'd think Jesus could do it on it, wouldn't you? He calls 12 apostles, one of them's a devil, so 11 of them to follow him. You say, why? For them to help him do what God called him to do. You know what those apostles do? They go through and they get the victuals and the food and stuff for him. They get the water for him. They set up the meetings for him. They take care of stuff. Elijah had enough sense to know he needed an Elisha. Paul knew he needed a Timothy. Uh, Moses knew that he needed a Joshua. It's all through there. People need people. You know what? the king said? He said, I can give you provision, but it ain't going to do you no good if you don't have people to help you put the provision in place. You need people. You need to get past that idea that you're so independent, you're independent of independent. And you just get this reclusive kind of an attitude. You think you're whatever that guy was that talked to a volleyball, uh, all that kind of stuff, uh, out on an island somewhere. I can't remember his name. Uh, weirdo. I can't. The, the chocolate guy, the box of chocolate guy. Who? That guy. 
you know, it, you know, you know, life is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> my life's never been like a box of chocolates. I don't ever have, I, there's nothing in my life I want to eat my life, you know, and that kind of a thing. And, you know, well, there's different flavors and different things in there. What an analogy. But at any rate, you know, run, Forrest, run, you know, that, <laughs> I guess that must be his email address or something. I don't, I don't know what that is. But, but let me, but let me ask you, let me ask you a question, ladies and gentlemen. Do you ever pause to think about where you'd be if it wasn't for people giving you a handle, giving you a hand, giving you a leg up? Amen. You ever pause? You ever, you ever say thank you? Amen. You ever go to those individuals, helped you along, go, I'm talking about at work. I'm not talking about just in the church. I'm talking about you ever, sir, you ever said to your wife, baby, I sure do appreciate you putting up with me. Sure. I'm positive every now and then my armpits smell. I'm sure my skivvies get dirty every now and then. I sure do appreciate, instead of you making a big deal out, I appreciate you washing them, honey. Appreciate you hanging up the clothes. Appreciate the groceries you get for me. Appreciate the meals you make for me. Forty cotton picking years of meals for that girl. Forty years of meals. You kidding me? Forty years of washing clothes, cleaning baseboards. You're mighty quiet in here, boys. Forty years. You say, that sounds like slavery to me. Don't tell her. Don't tell her. Shh. Don't say nothing. <laughs> she thinks she's serving the Lord, you know, so just, shh. Don't, don't say nothing. But, but, um, you do me a favor, Brother Roger, and check what's going on there in the uh, the back. The guy just went in there in the bathroom. I can't quite tell who that is. Anyway, don't panic on the Internet. Everything's fine. <laughs> he had on a mask, so. <laughs> anyway, he's probably one of the regular church. And he's like, what are you all accosting me for? I'm leaving the church. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But but I want you to listen to me. All good? Okay. So at least I'm not completely crazy. Turn on the air conditioner now and then broke out in a sweat. When I see two of the biggest guys in the church make their way to the back of the building, I'm just thinking, man, Elvis has done left the building, man. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel, please, quick. <laughs> but anyway, you ever think about this? You ever think that God's run people in your life along the way? Sometimes they're like scaffolding. They're just there to help you out, and, and they impact your life, and they help you. You never see them again. David's over there in 1 Samuel chapter number 30, and he comes back after Ziklag has been burned down, and he gets over there, and he asks the Lord, shall I pursue and shall I overtake? Pursue and overtake and go get them, and they go out with the warriors there, and they got the people that have to stop by the brook Besor. You know the story. You come to the end of that passage there. You know what they say? The warriors say, well, it's all our spoil. David said, no, we're going to give it to the waiters that are by the brook Besor, the guys that fought the battles long before you were ever here. But we got some other individuals, some watchers there. We got some other individuals. We got some people that have been waiting for years for me to be king. Back before y'all were even thought about, they were over there supporting what I was doing. And David said, we're going to divide the spoil among them and among the watchers that are by the brook and among the warriors. Now, you have to pause and think about that. You say, why would he say that? Sometimes people have been in your life, and you think to yourself, well, they didn't really do anything but give me a leg up. They're just scaffolding. They managed to get up the ceiling and get the stuff done needed to be done, then the scaffolding goes out. But you needed them when you needed the ceiling up. You ever pause long enough to thank them? You ever pause long enough to say, I sure appreciate it? Maybe the boss gave you a break. Maybe he should have wrote you up. Maybe he it, let it slide one time and you had to never go back and say, I sure appreciate that. I wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for that. Maybe. I'm not talking about illegal. I'm talking about immoral. Maybe. Just giving you a break because you happen to have one of those brain cramps where you melted down and didn't think right. What I'm saying to you is, before I get to this passage, is that Nehemiah recognized that no matter how much uh, uh, property he happened to have or how much of the provisions that he had, he still had to have people in order to get anything done. He didn't build that wall by himself. Ezra didn't build that temple by himself. You can have all the provisions in the world, but you've got to have people that know what they're doing. And I might say this, sometimes they have to be more expert than you are. You don't have to know everything. You know what you need to know? You need to know who to go to when you've got trouble. Where do I go to get some help? Uh, you go see a plumber when you got a problem with plumbing. Brother uh, uh, Robert said to me this morning, he said, you forgot the, the, the drain cleaner that goes in when it gets that clogged up. He said, you got a, a, a snake that you scroll down in there. It helps to clean out the drain. And I thought, well, that'll preach. He said, but you have to get that stuff cleared out of the pipe, the roots and stuff and all that that grow into the busted pipes and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes you have to cut out the bad pipe and put in a good pipe. 
I said, I believe I'll add that to my notes and stuff. Every now and then you know what you need, you have to go see a mechanic to get your car fixed. You say, why? Because you don't know how to fix it. So you take it somewhere. You ever go to a doctor? You do if you're seriously sick enough. You trust the doctor to tell you things about yourself that you don't know. I don't care how much WebMD says it. You do all that stuff and take eye of bat and wing of newt and all the other kind of deal on there and throw baking soda over your thing and drink apple cider vinegar and you still wind up sick. If you're sick enough, you're going to see a doctor. Yeah. And you're hoping they got some kind of medicine to give you. I'm simply saying to you, you might even need a lawyer one day. You say, why? You can't practice law unless you're a regular lawyer. And sometimes you have to have a lawyer. Oh, like, let's say, for instance, if you're purchasing something, like, a, oh, how about a house? You've got to have a lawyer to do all the legal paperwork or a real estate agent that has a license to be able to help you to be able to do the stuff so that it's all legal and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, but unless you've got a bajillion dollars in the bank, you've got to go to a bank to borrow money because you don't have the money. You follow what I'm trying to get across to you? You need people. God puts you in a body. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, you know what he said? He said, I formed a body to make it what I need it to be. And everything you need, John, need, John chapter number 6, is right there among you. But you have to be willing to go and ask people to help you out. Right. And sometimes you've got to have people that know how to do things you don't know how to do. Amen. Kids, I'm going to say this to you, and I'm going to move to this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You have an opportunity to have a wealth of knowledge here. Don't get advice from your peers. They're idiots. Amen. They're in the same situation you're in and they don't have enough life under their belt to know anything. They're going to be blindsided because they're going to view your life through their own eyes and they're not going to be able to give you the right kind of advice. Go to these old people in here. Go to these old men and women. You listen to me, what I'm telling you. Sit down and have dinner with them and ask them questions. You say, well, why would I do that stuff? I can tell you why you do it. It'll save you a lot of bumps and bruises. Some of these old people got a wealth of knowledge. You know what you can do? You can learn something about 40 years. Take you 40 years to learn. You sit down and talk to somebody for an hour. That old preacher told me one time, and he said, we were fixing to go somewhere to eat. And he said to me, he said, now, he said, uh, two ears, one mouth, buddy. Two ears, one mouth. And I said, yes, sir. What are you saying? He said, well, he said, a lot of these guys have been in the ministry longer you've been alive. He said, sometimes you'll sit down around the table and you'll find out that at the meeting that what goes on around the table is more important than what happens in the pulpit. And he said, what you might learn is you might sit there and get one thing that'll shave 10 years off your experience if you just listen to these old guys, but they don't talk if you're talking at the same time. That's profound. He said, every meal won't be that way. Every time you get together won't be that way. But if it happened to you one time, wouldn't it be worth it? Man, I got so many times he opened up doors for me to go in there and just to sit down with a bunch of old guys and listen to them tell stories and things like that. And some of them amount to a roll pins. Some of them is kind of like listening to a bunch of old geezers sitting around a rocking chair saying things. But every now and then they'd float something out there and I'm thinking, my goodness, man, I didn't know that. And you're thinking to yourself, you know what you just got? You got the benefit of a guy that's been in the ministry 40, 50, 60 years and he just shaved, saved you from making a mess because you had enough sense to listen. You need people. Did I say that to you already? You need people. You need people. You're supposed to be an independent Baptist, but not so independent that you separate yourself from meeting other people. And that's more than just your family and more than just people that's like you. I like them. I like him. I like her. I, I just like them. Well, sometimes the people you like, they may not have the best bedside manner, but sometimes the people you like are dumb as a box of rocks and they'll lie to you because they're more worried about the friendship with you than telling you the truth. I'd rather have somebody that doesn't have the bedside manner that'll be straight up with me, especially if my life's on the line, than to be worried about, well, he could have said it in a nicer way. My foot, man, I need some help right now. Tell me what the problem is and set me straight. And I'll deal with my personal feelings later on. You need people. 1 Corinthians chapter number, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry, chapter number 1. Look at verse number 17. I apologize. I hear the pages turning. The 2 Corinthians will be right after 1 Corinthians. It's back toward the right. Verse number 17, make it 16. And to pass by you in Macedon, unto Macedon, into Macedonia and to come again to Macedonia unto you and you be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? You know, was I nonchalant about it? Did I, did I act, you know, carelessly about it? Did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose things that I purpose? Do I purpose things that I purpose? Do I purpose? Watch. According 
according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay, question mark. But as God is true and our word is true, and our word toward you was not yea and nay. You know what Paul's saying right there? Paul is saying, I'm not vacillating one minute and walking in the flesh one minute, walking in the spirit the next minute, and one minute I say yes, and I say, well, I've changed my mind. Well, door number one, no two, no three, no one, no I. Well, I'm just not really, I'm, I'm just really confused right now. Paul said, there was no question. I purposed in my mind, I made up a decision, and I stuck with the decision. When it comes to making purpose, there's a reason why you do that. It's to keep you from vacillating all over the map. Make up your cotton-picking mind Amen. is what some preachers used to say. Make your mind up, make a decision, and get on with whatever it is that you're going to try to do. One preacher used to say, lead, follow, or get the heck out of the way. Well, that's not a bad thought. Instead of just standing around and kind of waiting to see what the popular decision is, make up your mind, I'm going to cling to Jesus Christ. I'm going to do my best to cleave uh, my relationship and His and put everything else aside. I made up my mind, I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's that, I'm done. Not, well, I'm going to follow Jesus today, it's Sunday, but tomorrow's, you know, it's Labor Day. And I mean, you know, I'm going to have a hamburger and a hot dog and a, just a couple beers, you know. I mean, I'm not going to get drunk or nothing. Just a couple of pots. It's hot, you know. It's hot outside. I mean, you know, I mean, it's Labor Day. You say, no, surely not. I guarantee you there's people watching right now. That they're turning off that thing or punching that rat thing and turning that thing off because it's like, well, now, wait a minute. Because some kids are going, Daddy, you still going to get that yellow stuff that looks like horse pee out of the refrigerator? <laughs> I can't imagine, I can't imagine. Maybe some of you have done that before, and this is completely off of it. I can't imagine you'd be out there uh, cooking over your, you know, your grill and something, like you're, you know, the grill chef, the master chef, or whatever that thing is, the Ramsey guy, and, you know, and all that without all the language. And you're, you know, you're cooking all that kind of stuff. And you look down at your, your five, six, seven-year-old kid and say, uh, go bring me a beer. I guess some of you must have done that. You, you kind of like, what's wrong with that, preacher? Well, I don't know. If I have to tell you what's wrong with that, then you've got a problem. Amen. I don't have a problem. Amen. I can't imagine being raised by a dad that way. Bring me a beer. Pour me a shot, baby. Happy hour somewhere, you know. It's 5 o'clock somewhere in the world. <laughs> yeah, it ain't funny to me. I've seen too many lives ruined by it. Too many Christians, I can handle it, I can handle it, I can handle it and go by there. Paul's talking about his manner of life. I guarantee you he don't come through Publix with a shopping cart full of wine and tell them it's for cooking. Good. And they're looking at you and saying, we need some help right now. And okay, well, you need some help. Well, you just like everybody else. Your answer to the question or the problem is, is you just get drunk. Why else do you drink? I'm making you uncomfortable. I'm glad. Amen. Why else do you drink? You ever wonder why a woman runs around half naked? She's trying to draw attention. You surely you know that. You're not stupid. Surely you recognize that. There's only one reason that you would dress that way, because you're wanting people to look at you. Then you get mad when they do, but you're wanting people to look at you. That's the truth. Well, let me ask you this question. Let's apply the same logic. Why else would you drink if you didn't intend to get drunk? To loosen it up? Take off the pressure? Relax a little bit, chill out some, been a hard day today, need a couple of pops just to kind of kind of smooth things out a little bit so I can sleep. That's why you drink. There ain't no other reason you drink. Well, I, I like it. Would you like it if it didn't anesthetize you? Would you like it if it didn't make you feel tipsy? Would you like it if it didn't make you feel lightheaded? Would you like it if it wasn't your go-to when you had a problem instead of going to your knees and bowing your head and praying and asking God to help you? Would you, would you still fool with it if you didn't get the little buzz out of it? And fool him at all. The Lord looks down there and he knows why you drink. Well, preacher, you know, nowadays is the day and time in which we live. You can't help it. You ought to understand. I do understand. Look in Daniel chapter number 1. Daniel chapter number 1. The preacher called me from up in Tennessee the other day. He said, man, he said, I, I thought I'd been being hard on my folks, and then I heard you, and my goodness, man. <laughs> he said, I feel sorry for your folks. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, man, you're rough. I said, brother, you don't understand my congregation. If I'm not, they will run me out of town on a rail. Amen. You were supposed to say amen there, because I sure... <laughs> he's probably listening, and he's going, yeah, nobody agreed with you there, so... <laughs> 
But I'm trying to be honest with you. I'm trying to be straightforward. You can't wait until the pressure's on to decide that liquor's not going to be your answer to it. I had a friend that I know, a friend, a guy that I know, I've known him for a long time. He's been pretty well straight for about 12 years. He was a heroin addict for a while. And uh, <clears throat> preacher, how you doing? Good to talk to you, man. How's things going? Well, doing all right, man. Doing okay. He said, uh, I said, how are you doing? I know he's calling me because he ain't doing. That's what I know. <laughs> well, um, well, um, you know, preacher, uh, um, I said, you mess up? He said, yes, sir. He said, after all those years, I said, okay. I said, well, fess up. Get on with life, man. Let's, let's move out. He goes, well, it ain't that easy. I said, you've been thinking about it a long time. I said, and the first time you had the excuse, that was the avenue of escape for you. You've been planning that for a long time. That didn't just slip up on you. You've been running around with people with the same problem so that you could get yourself ready so that when it happened, you could justify doing what you're doing. I've never known of a single adulterous affair that there wasn't a good excuse for one or the other of them doing what they're doing. Always a good excuse. You say, what is that? That's Bob Jones Sr. saying, before the individual steps off into the far country, there's been a long line of wicked thinking and preparation. That boy didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm headed for the far country. He'd been thinking about it. He'd been dwelling on it. Yep. That's why that Bible teaches you about purposing in your heart, making your mind up now. You say, why? Because if you don't, those things will start creeping in there. You know what you'll do? You'll convince yourself you have justification for doing what you're about to do, whatever it might be. Because right. you're a special set of circumstances. Amen. Right? You young kids, you know what will happen? You'll get close to a boy or a girl and you'll think you're in love. And you may be, for all I know. It might be another word starting with an L, but you think you're in love. It's puppy love, but a real to the puppy. You know what you better do? You better curb that way of thinking because the next thing you'll be thinking is, well, if I'm in love, I should act like I'm married. And the next thing you know, it's a runaway freight train. Here comes the Fireball Express, Cannonball Express. You say, how'd you, you, uh-uh, uh-uh. It didn't just oops happen. Right, 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 right. That thing's been leading up, leading up, leading up, leading up, leading up, leading up. Bam! Amen. Got you just like that. The Lord teaching you that if you'll purpose in your heart, as Daniel's fixing to do right here, I made up my mind before the temptation came that I wasn't going to do it. Now, if you don't do that, when that temptation comes, I guarantee the Lord compares it to a man taking fire into his bosom and it burning him up. I'm telling you right now, if you don't make plans for it, there ain't nobody in here going to be able to do it. If you have a man by the name of King David who wasn't able to put that thing down and got himself into the mess he got himself into you, unless you think you're better than King David, yes, boy, you better dial her back. Yes. Amen. You better dial her back. Yes. You say, why? Because all of a sudden, bad set of circumstances. She don't understand me. He don't understand me. Well, I love him. Well, I love her. Well, we're going to be together forever. Well, I mean, I guess it doesn't matter. Well, everybody else does and all that. That's how you've been thinking. And then the thing happens and the things begin to lead up and the Holy Spirit says, hey, 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 hey. Get out, get out, stop, 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 stop. Now come the tears, now come the heartache, now come the problems, now come the difficulty. You say, oh man, you don't know what you're talking about. I don't mean to be a jerk, but let me just say to you right now, I may know more about it than you think I do. I dealt with that stuff for years and years and years and years and years. I've never seen an exception to the rule, not once. It'll get you every time. Amen. It's gotten people that are better than me and you and all of us put together Amen. and drug them right to the bottom of the depths of depravity. Yes. Never get me, never get me, never get me. Gotcha. Gotcha. Look at this thing in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter number one. 
uh, the Bible says this in verse number 8. This is when they've been taken into captivity here. And the Bible says this, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Have you ever wondered to yourself why it was that when the woman came up there to Joseph over there, Potiphar's wife, and she comes over there and said, Daniel, lie with me. And Daniel, she grabbed him by the coat and Daniel dumped, uh, dumped his coat out there and got rid of his coat and saved his character. That'll preach at any rate. And that kind of thing, she accused him of that. You ever wonder how he got up and got out of there? He'd made his mind up long before that ever happened, what he'd do if it ever happened. You know what happened with Daniel here? He's been taken in and he's in there in the king's palace. He has an opportunity right here, right now to preserve his own life. You know what he said? I'm not eating the king's meat. You say, why? It's against something I've decided a long time ago. You know what got Samson in trouble? Samson got in trouble because he ate something he shouldn't have ate. You know what got Eve in trouble? She ate something she wasn't supposed to eat. Yep. You say, what do you have to do? Make your mind up now. I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat. Amen. And for you, that would have to do with the way the world, the flesh, and the devil work. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Now, i got to be honest with you and straight up with you and those kind of things. I'm pretty hard on liquor and alcohol and stuff. And not because I think I'm the victorious guy that can't. I recognized a long time ago I better stay away from it. Amen. And I'll tell you why. I'm afraid of it. I'm not afraid I'll wind up a sop drunk laying in the gutter somewhere. I'm afraid I'll like it. The stuff that's up in my head, I'm thinking, be good to forget some of that every now and then, you know, and be able to, you know, and all that kind of deal. I'm scared of it. I'm afraid I might, you know, might become my excuse for doing all this foolishness. And that's what people get drunk for, to let the real them come out. They look like the incredible bulk that comes out there, you know, you know, and all that kind of a deal. That's what they do under the influence of liquor and alcohol. It's what they really want to do, but they use the liquor to be able to mask it. Oh, I couldn't help it. I was drunk. Uh-huh. The only reason is, is that that thing anesthetized your conscience and you put the Holy Ghost to sleep. That's why you did it, because you've been thinking about doing it. Daniel said, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I'm not about to do it. And Daniel's willing to pay with his life. Let me try to give you a few more of these quick. Come to Proverbs chapter number 15. Proverbs chapter 15. Go back toward Genesis. If you can't find it, go to the table of contents. Job, Psalms, Proverbs. I'm not being funny. I'm saying that's how you learn the Bible. Don't let these, these Christians around here fool you because they can get it. They think they're in a sword drill. Every time I call out a passage, you know, they're like, I got it. Y'all ain't got it yet? Y'all ain't been reading your Bible? They started the same way. Every one of them in here started with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and First and Second, Samuel. That's where we all started. Don't let them fool you just because they got it down now. They use the same table of contents. What you don't know is they've gotten real smart with it. They've taken tabs off now and they use braille things on the sides of their Bible so they can kind of find it, you know. So they, all of a sudden, whew, there it is. And you're thinking, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> they learned how to read braille. <laughs> they know how to mark up their Bible. Don't be intimidated by that. That's how you learn the Bible. You flip through it and flip through it and flip through it. You flip through it enough times, you get familiar with it. You say, well, preacher, you seem to find them all pretty good. I'm still looking for Hezekiah. I hadn't found that one yet. <laughs> In there somewhere, but, but, I, but, I, but you, you say, why? Well, shouldn't I be familiar with it if I'm in it every day? I'm your pastor. Shouldn't I know something about it? They don't give any accolades for that. That's what I'm supposed to do. You expect a banker to be familiar with, with money, don't you? Don't you? I hope so. Some of you are like, well, I know we're kind of looking for the one we can pass off some counterfeit bills, you know. <laughs> All right, look if you will, please. Proverbs chapter 15. Come all the way down, if you will, to verse number 22. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in a multitude of counselors, they are established. You know what he said? He said, if you have a purpose, you need to go to somebody and to be able to find out how to do it. Leave your finger right there. Let me give you an example of that real quick. Let me give you a biblical example. It'll be uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke 14. Luke chapter 14. Leave your finger there in Proverbs. If you need to, we're coming back to it. Look at this thing in Luke chapter number 14. This is a good illustration. Luke 14, make it verse uh, 26. The multitudes are there with him. The Lord's going to thin the crowd out a little bit here. And he says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother, wife and children, brethren, sisters, yea, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intended to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it. And all, and, and, uh, all that behold it began to begin to mock him. 
Now, what he's saying there to you is, is he said, when you start something out, if your purpose is that this is what I believe the Lord wants me to do and I believe the direction he wants me to go, he says, sit down and consider it. Think about it. How are you going to complete the task? Don't run off half cocked. I'd suggest even this. Don't jump off the horse your own until another horse comes by. Don't be in such a hurry to try to jump off the pinnacle of the temple and prove how spiritual you are. Let God provide for you. Where God God, He provides. Give you the guarantee of that. But you know what He said? Purposes are frustrated when after you've decided this is what I want to do, you don't have enough sense to go ask somebody who's done it, how do I do this? Do you have any suggestions? Do you have any thoughts? Do you have any ideas? Should I do this? Shouldn't I do that? That's all he's saying to you. He's saying, if you got the purpose, that's a great thing, but it'd be good for you to get a little help along the way. I told you you need some people. Come back to the book of Proverbs, trying to hurry. Proverbs uh, chapter number 20. Nothing wrong with, uh, with building a building, according to that passage right there, but he said, you know what will happen? If you don't consider things, guess what's going to take place? You're going to, they're going to see an unfinished building and come by and mock you, yeah. make fun of you. Well, it's the same thing when it comes to life. Well, I've been called to go to the mission field. Okay, did you make any preparation? No, I just went out and started trying to raise money, and I don't know what the deal is. I've been on deputation now for two and a half, three years, and nobody's supporting me, and everybody's asking me, did I go to school, and did I know this, and do I know that, and I haven't even worked a job or whatever, and the next thing you know, they're laughing and mocking you because your purpose was a good purpose, but you just didn't take the time to figure out how you're going to get to where you're going. Listen, these military guys, you got a fire team leader here from over in Iraq that was here. He's sitting right back there with his wife and, and you over there. You know what he does when you go over there? He's prepared over here and then they load them all up with stuff that's in their knapsack and in their bag and in their duffel bag and in their weapon and so on and so forth. They don't get out to the field and then all of a sudden check their, their uh, weapon and look in that thing and go, oh, we forgot the bullets. Well, that's a bad thing, especially if you're at war. I don't know if you know that or not. It ain't like Barney Five. Oh, no, wait, they gave me one here. I'm good to go. You got a Marine sitting back there in the back corner. I don't know if he actually saw action or not, but he was always preparing as if they were to call him at any moment, at any time, the government owned him. You know what they did? They prepared him now so that if they sent him anywhere in the entire world, they would give him the provision that he needed and the training that he needed to be able to meet whatever the opposition was. You have a couple of nurses sitting back over here. They've been trained. And you just have another one sitting right back. She's not here tonight. But we have a couple of nurses sitting there. You got an EMT sitting over here. You got fire people in here. You got police in here. The, the, the thing is all the way across the board, what do they do? They spend hours and 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 hours. And hours and hours and hours, and you got nurses up here too, and training. You say, for what? Not for just what they do on their regular job, but what happens in case of an emergency. The time to learn CPR, ladies and gentlemen, is not down there when somebody is in dire need of help. The time to learn it is now when it's quiet so that when it melts down. Uh, all right, Proverbs chapter number, did I give you the one in 20? I haven't given you that, have I? Verse 20, I mean, verse 18. Every purpose is established by what? Counsel and with what? Good advice, make war. He doesn't say don't make war. He said make sure you get the right advice before you make war. You know what he said? Every purpose is established how? He doesn't say the idea for the purpose is established by counsel. He said once you get the purpose, you need to sit down and talk to some people and establish how you're going to go about uh, getting that thing done. Come all the way to Acts chapter number 26. Let me just give you a couple of more here. Acts chapter 26. Stop off in Isaiah. That'll be along the way there. Isaiah chapter number 11. The independent Baptist among us. Did you hear the air come on? <laughs> Have you been talking to him about saving money? Help me, Lord Jesus. I, I don't have time to do Isaiah right now. <laughs> Come to Acts chapter 26. I got to get this before it gets completely out of hand. <laughs> Acts chapter 26. Thank you, Brother Roger. I feel better already. I can feel it blowing down my neck. Paul's purpose was to do what? Preach the gospel. 
you knew that right off the bat, to deliver revelations that were given him to instruct the church. In Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter oh, 08, you know what will happen? It said they constructed a pulpit of wood. You know what the pulpit was for? For them to stand on for the purpose, for the purpose, for the purpose of preaching the word. In other words, in the Bible, God purposes, he intends for you to have a purpose to your life, a point in your life. Now, that's been cheapened because of this purpose-driven life foolishness and all that other kind of stuff. But there's a truth in that statement. Your life should be driven by a purpose. What are you trying to accomplish? Where are you trying to go? People that are always critical of other people have too much time on their hands. You want me to give you a cure for criticism? Stop trying to stop yourself from being critical. Just get busy. You'll be so busy and you'll catch so much flack for being busy, you won't have any time to be critical of anybody else. If all you have is time to be able to research all the time what everybody's doing and what everybody's saying and how everybody's this and that and the other, and even including the people that are lying about you, thank God they're not telling the truth, and all of you do, you know what you're doing? You're spending all your time trying to refute somebody that's saying something because you're not busy enough. If you're busy, guess what? I'm too busy. I ain't got time to talk to you about it. In that passage he's trying to get across to you, listen, you got a purpose in your life, then get busy about doing what God wants you to do and let him, Psalm 63, to take care of the naysayer, take care of the liar, take care of the people that are, that are running you down, throwing you under the bus. Pause and think for just a minute. Somebody that's criticizing you has to have only time to be able to focus on you. You can't get nothing done with somebody like that. You say, why? They don't have anything to do. They're like some individuals you, you go to a meeting sometime. And you say, can you answer a couple questions? Sure. You have an individual invariably that will be there who spends all of his time working on one question. And he's an expert in one question. He didn't open the Bible for anything else. It's just that one thing. He's become an expert at it. Well, don't it say in Isaiah 12? Doesn't it say this? Doesn't it say in Isaiah 14? What about Jeremiah number 42? Well, don't you know that he sounds like a Bible scholar. And you're thinking to yourself, all you have is time to do one thing. I'm trying to do a hundred. And okay, you're the expert at it. So now we know you asked the question not to find out what you really wanted to know, but to let everybody know that you're the expert on that particular thing. That's like arguing with a guy of Church of Christ, Acts 2.38. Yeah, but Acts 2.38. Yeah, but Acts 2.38. Yeah, but Acts 2.38. Yeah, but Acts 2.38. You sound like a cotton-picking parrot. Yep. Amen. Right. Amen. <laughs> What's that joke about the guy that broke into the house that time and all that kind of a deal and the parrot was there? Is that the one where the parrot says, you know, here comes Jesus, you know, you better watch out. Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. Jesus is watching you. <laughs> and the guy says, shut up, man. What are you talking about? Then all of a sudden a big Doberman pincher comes in there, a Rottweiler, and he said, watch out. Here comes Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, watch out. Here comes Jesus. Too late now. You should have been backed out of the corner a long time ago. All right, look, if you will, please, let me wrap this thing up for you. Look in Acts chapter 26. Come all the way down to verse number 16. But rise and stand upon the feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose. To do what? To make thee a minister and a witness, both these things and that which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear to thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee. You know what he said to the Apostle Paul? I had a purpose. I had a reason. Above the brightness of the sun, that thing came down there. I called you out, and your purpose was is to go to people that otherwise wouldn't get it if you're not willing to go do what I tell you to do. Paul, your purpose in life is to go preach for me. Go tell other people for me. That's what he tells you. Well, if we believe all things work together for good, then love God, then we're called according to his purpose. Wouldn't you think that'd be good? According to his what? Purpose. According to his what? Purpose. Don't you find that to be odd? Well, preacher, you know all things work together for good. Yeah, but you forgot the rest of the verse. 1 John 3 and I'm done. 1 John 3. You know what the rest of the verse is? According to his... Well, do you know what his purpose is for you? Have you ever asked him? See, preacher, what's that? Is that the will of God you're talking about? You can make it that. The purpose of God. What's God want you to do? Sit on your dead behind and do nothing? I don't think so. He has something He wants you to do. Maybe it's not preach. Maybe it's not run crusades. Maybe it's not uh, uh, be a, 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 what do you call them, a, a soloist. Maybe it's not play an instrument. Uh, maybe it's not to preach or to teach the Bible. Maybe it's not to be a missionary. How about be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good father, be a good mother? How about be a good kid? How about that? You know what I know? I know sometimes God's purpose changes along the way. Sometimes He has a purpose for you to do one thing, and then He has you move on to something else. 
you can't, you can't expect to be running out to the mission field when you're trying to raise a bunch of kids, but maybe after you get the kids raised, the Lord's like, well, you did a good job as a mom and a husband there. I think I'll put you out on the mission field and let you take care of somebody else's kids a while. Life changes, it shifts. Romans 8, 28 says, For we know, for I know, for we know, for we know, all things work together for good to them that love God, them that are called according to His purpose. What's God want you to do? So the all things there is not across the board. It's if you're obtaining the purpose of God. Those things work together for God, Amen. for good. Do you know what God's purpose is for you to be here? I can tell you one of them is to tell others about Jesus. All right, 1 John chapter 3. We'll close out with this one right here, talking about purpose. 1 John chapter number 3. Look, if you will, all the way down to verse number uh, 8. The Bible says, He that committeth sin is, uh, uh, is of the devil. The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the... You know what he just said to you there? He said, uh, the devil is here and he's going to cause you to sin. And the, what God did was he came with a purpose. You say, what was it? To destroy the one causing the sin. I sure am glad he fulfilled his purpose. Amen. Amen. The question would be this. Are you fulfilling your purpose? Paul's clarifying in that passage there in Timothy his position, his purpose, saying in a sense that there's nothing hidden. Now it's fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose. He's wanting them to know why I'm here. This is why I'm here. I'm telling you why I'm here. These things I've just told you in these last four or five verses, I'm here to proclaim those things to you because it's what God sent me to do. My purpose in life is to warn you about these things. That's what Paul's saying. All right, let's stand together and be dismissed.